Dozens of former U.S. officials urge Biden to take harder line with Israel. A group of nearly 70 former U.S. officials, diplomats, and military officers has urged President Joe Biden to warn Israel about potential consequences if it continues to deny civil rights and basic necessities to Palestinians while expanding settlement activity in the occupied West Bank. The group, which includes former ambassadors, State Department officials, and other retired government officials, emphasizes the need for concrete action to oppose such practices, including potential restrictions on U.S. assistance to Israel. The letter highlights concerns over Israeli military operations against Hamas militants in Gaza. Acknowledging the necessity of such operations but criticizing them for repeated violations of international law, particularly regarding civilian casualties. The group supports Biden's call for an immediate truce, humanitarian aid delivery, and the release of hostages, while also urging the Israeli military to adhere to international law in its rules of engagement. Israel slams arms sale ban as Trudeau caves to minority party, history will judge Canada harshly. Canada has decided to halt the export of weapons to Israel, drawing immediate criticism from the Israeli government. The decision comes after the Canadian government embraced a motion drafted by the minority left-leaning New Democrats Party, NDP, which originally included measures such as recognizing a Palestinian state and calling for a ceasefire. However, the final version focused on ending the transfer of arms exports to Israel as a concern that arms could end up in terrorist hands. Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau's government and the NDP negotiated various changes to the motion. With Trudeau's Liberals Party ultimately supporting the modified resolution. Canadian Foreign Affairs Minister Melanie Jolie confirmed the decision to end future arms sales to Israel, emphasizing its significance. The move reflects Trudeau's increasingly critical stance over Israeli military operations in Gaza, amid a surge in anti-Semitism in Canada. Critics argue that Canada's decision undermines Israel's right to self-defense and sends a harmful message to the Jewish community. The NDP support is crucial for Trudeau's government, as they signed an agreement ensuring support on key votes until 2025, without the possibility of a coalition government. Schumer rejects Netanyahu's request to talk to Democrats as Israeli leader addresses GOP. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu addressed Republican senators in a closed-door meeting, receiving a warm reception. However, Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer declined Netanyahu's request to address the Senate Democratic Caucus, citing concerns about partisanship. Tensions between Netanyahu and top Democratic leaders in the U.S. have escalated amid disagreements over Israel's conduct in Gaza. Schumer criticized Netanyahu for exacerbating partisan divisions, expressing concern that it harms Israel's interests. The roots of democratic discontent with Netanyahu stem from his confrontational approach with former President Barack Obama and his perceived alignment with the GOP. Netanyahu's acceptance of a Republican invitation to address Congress in 2015 further strained relations. Despite Republican support for Netanyahu, Democratic leaders like Schumer and Dick Durbin have voiced concerns about Netanyahu's actions. McConnell disagreed with Schumer's criticism, emphasizing that the U.S. should not interfere in Israel's internal affairs. Republican senators expressed solidarity with Netanyahu's stance against Hamas and criticized Schumer's remarks about Israeli elections. Overall, the split between Democrats and Republicans on Israel highlights the polarizing views of Netanyahu's leadership and Israel's policies. Ukraine aid has stalled in Congress, but a Trump-backed plan is picking up steam. Interest is growing in delivering funds to Ukraine as a loan, a proposal initially suggested by former President Donald Trump. While a $95 billion spending package for Ukraine, primarily aimed at providing aid, is stuck in the House due to opposition, the idea of a loan is gaining traction among some Republican lawmakers. Senator Lindsey Graham and House Speaker Mike Johnson have both supported the loan idea, likening it to the Marshall Plan. However, concerns remain about the logistics and potential delays associated with implementing a loan-based approach. Some lawmakers, including Senator Joni Ernst and Rep. Brian Fitzpatrick, express willingness to support a loan if it helps expedite aid delivery to Ukraine. Opposition to additional funds for Ukraine has increased among ultra-conservative lawmakers, but the loan proposal endorsed by Trump may provide a way forward for supporters of Ukraine aid. While some Democratic leaders prefer the original aid package, they acknowledge the possibility of considering a loan if the current bill faces further delays. The Biden administration has not ruled out the possibility of a loan, signaling that it is being considered as an option to provide assistance to Ukraine.
U.S. military aid package will get to Ukraine, Jake Sullivan says on Kiev trip. White House National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan, during his visit to Kiev, assured that a major U.S. aid package for Ukraine, stalled by Republicans in Congress, would eventually reach Ukraine. The aid, crucial for Ukrainian troops facing Russian aggression, has been delayed since late last year. Sullivan expressed confidence in achieving bipartisan support for the aid package and dismissed the idea of providing aid in the form of a loan, emphasizing the need for urgent assistance. Discussions in Kiev also covered Ukraine's battlefield needs, the upcoming NATO summit, and a proposed peace summit in Switzerland. Ukraine aims to exclude Russia from the peace summit, seeking China's participation as a diplomatic victory. Yermak, Ukraine's presidential chief of staff, expressed optimism about China's potential involvement in the peace process following a recent visit by a senior Chinese envoy to European capitals, including Kiev and Moscow. Ukraine's Zelensky says world must make global rule of law work again. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky, speaking at a global conference hosted by South Korea, called on world leaders to uphold a rules-based international order and stand against Russian aggression. Zelensky emphasized the importance of restoring the international rule of law and making the rules work again to counter Russian use of force. He urged the U.S. Congress to join efforts in supporting Ukraine and emphasized the need for solidarity among nations. The Summit for Democracy, initiated by U.S. President Joe Biden, focused on addressing democratic backsliding and threats to rights and freedoms, particularly digital threats such as AI-powered misinformation. Meanwhile, Russia's defense minister announced plans to bolster its military presence in Ukraine, indicating ongoing tensions in the region. Russia reaffirmed its goals in Ukraine, including demilitarization and denazification of occupied regions, amid concerns about NATO's influence in the area. Russia says EU frozen assets plan is theft, will lead to decades of lawsuits. Russia strongly condemned a proposal by European Union foreign policy chief Josep Borrell to use 90% of revenues from Russian assets frozen in Europe to purchase weapons for Ukraine. The Kremlin denounced the plan as banditry and theft, warning that it would damage Europe's reputation as a guardian of property rights and lead to years of litigation. The proposal suggests redirecting proceeds from Russian assets to the European Peace Facility, which provides military aid to countries outside the EU, primarily Ukraine. Russia criticized the potential consequences of such actions on Europe's economy and reputation. Approximately 70% of Russian assets immobilized in the West are held in Euroclear, Belgium, amounting to around 190 billion euros, 206 billion dollars, worth of various Russian central bank securities and cash. Russia vowed to respond if the West proceeds with confiscating its assets, indicating potential retaliation against Western assets in return. Pakistan repulses attack near Chinese-funded port in southwest, killing eight insurgents, officials say. In Quetta, Pakistan, security forces successfully thwarted an attack by a separatist group on a government building near the Chinese-funded Gwadar port. At least eight insurgents were killed in the operation, which also resulted in the deaths of three security forces personnel. The attack began with a suicide bombing followed by gunmen hurling hand grenades at security forces. Despite the violence, all Chinese nationals working at the port remained unharmed. Prime Minister Shabazz Sharif and Interior Minister Mohsen Nakvi commended the security forces for their swift response in neutralizing the attackers. The Baluchistan Liberation Army, an outlawed separatist group seeking independence from Islamabad, claimed responsibility for the attack. Despite government claims of quelling the insurgency, violence continues to plague the Baluchistan province, which also faces a presence of Islamic militants. Iranian threats to U.S. have metastasized, as proxies employ tactics targeting homeland, House hearing. The House Committee on Homeland Security held a hearing focusing on the threats posed by Iran and its proxy forces to the U.S. and its interests. Chairman Mark Green highlighted various security concerns, including assassination plots targeting U.S. officials, attacks on U.S. service members abroad, disruption of trade and commerce, and coordination of terror operations in Europe and South America. The hearing addressed the scope and pace of these threats and involved testimony from intelligence leaders. The witnesses emphasized the extensive network of Iran's proxy organizations, including Hezbollah, Hamas, the Houthis, and others, operating across multiple countries and receiving support from the Iranian regime. Concerns were raised about potential retaliatory attacks by Hezbollah and other groups against U.S. officials, both domestically and overseas.
Additionally, Iran-backed cyber espionage and transnational repression activities targeting dissidents were highlighted as ongoing threats. Instances of planned assassination attempts on U.S. soil were also mentioned, underscoring the persistent threat posed by Iran and its proxies to U.S. security and interests. Citing safety risk, Taiwan recommends president does not visit S. China C. In response to calls for Taiwanese President Tsai Ing-wen to visit ITU-ABA, Taiwan's top security official has expressed concerns about potential risks to her flight due to interference by relevant countries in the South China Sea. Tsai Ming-yen, Director General of the Taiwan National Security Bureau, highlighted the militarization of the region and the need to consider international perceptions. He mentioned instances where other countries' aircraft and ships have faced interference from relevant parties in the area, raising doubts about the safety of the president's flight to ITU-ABA, located 994 miles away. China's military presence in the South China Sea, including the construction of military facilities, adds to the complexity. While ITU-ABA has strategic significance for Taiwan, being capable of accommodating military resupply flights, concerns persist regarding potential interference from China. Tsai Mingyan acknowledged instances where Chinese forces have interfered with Taiwanese Coast Guard or military aircraft in the region. This situation underscores ongoing tensions in the South China Sea, where multiple countries, including Taiwan, China, Vietnam, Malaysia, and Brunei, have territorial claims. China's Navy ship tails Philippine Coast Guard amid sea spat. The Philippines reported that a Chinese Navy ship trailed its Coast Guard vessel en route to a Philippines-occupied island in the South China Sea. The incident occurred amid escalating tensions between the two nations over overlapping maritime claims. The Philippine Coast Guard issued radio challenges to the Chinese vessel but received no response. Additionally, 13 Chinese militia vessels and two Chinese Coast Guard boats were observed near Thitu Island, where about 250 Filipino residents reside. This development follows President Ferdinand Marcos Jr.'s remarks on the growing threat posed by China's claims in the South China Sea. Tensions intensified further after a collision between Philippine and Chinese Coast Guard ships, prompting diplomatic complaints. U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken condemned China's provocative actions during his visit to Manila, reiterating the U.S. commitment to Philippine security. Longtime Trump employee, Mar-a-Lago culture would have led many to commit crimes. Brian Butler, a longtime employee of Donald Trump referred to as Trump Employee 5 in the classified documents indictment, testified before a grand jury, providing crucial information used to charge Trump. Butler described a culture of loyalty around Trump that could drive individuals to extreme lengths to protect him. He recounted his testimony before the grand jury and meetings with special counsel Jack Smith, emphasizing the constant contact he had with co-defendants and his honesty in providing information to prosecutors. Butler believes the environment surrounding Trump could lead people to break the law on his behalf. He also revealed Trump's concern about potentially incriminating videos. Butler's testimony sheds light on the dynamics within Trump's inner circle and the loyalty Trump expects from those around him. Supreme Court should consider presidential immunity for Trump, Ohio Attorney General says. Ohio Attorney General Dave Yost has filed an amicus brief in the U.S. Supreme Court case Trump v. United States, supporting former President Donald Trump's argument for presidential immunity from criminal charges related to the January 6, 2021, Capitol attack. Yost argues that presidential immunity is essential for the president to fulfill their oath of office but acknowledges that it is not unlimited. He suggests a two-part legal test for determining presidential immunity, First, examining how closely the accused acts align with the president's constitutional powers, and second, considering whether the president's actions were necessary given the urgency of the situation. The court will hear oral arguments in April, with Yost joining attorneys general from Wyoming, Alaska in submitting the brief. Judge says Michael Cohen may have committed perjury, refuses to end his probation early. A federal judge, Jesse M. Furman, suggested that Michael Cohen may have committed perjury under oath, which lends support to former President Donald Trump's assertions that Cohen is an untrustworthy liar. Judge Furman cited Cohen's testimony at Trump's civil fraud trial last October, where Cohen denied guilt for tax evasion despite previously pleading guilty to the charge in 2018. Furman highlighted Cohen's contradictory statements, suggesting either perjury during his guilty plea or during his trial testimony. Despite objections from Cohen's lawyer, the judge maintained Cohen's court supervision indicating the ongoing need for deterrence against his actions.
Trump and his legal team have repeatedly criticized Cohen's credibility, especially after Cohen's backtracking on initial statements during the civil fraud trial. Cohen's role as a prosecution witness in Trump's hush money criminal trial has been subject to scrutiny, with Trump's lawyers attempting to discredit him based on his past actions. However, the judge in the hush money trial ruled against barring Cohen's testimony, emphasizing that previous actions suggesting perjury were not sufficient grounds for exclusion. India finds rogue officials involved in U.S. murder plot, Bloomberg reports. An Indian investigation into a foiled plot to kill a Sikh separatist leader in the United States has found that rogue officials, not authorized by the government, were involved. The investigation, conducted by a government-appointed panel, revealed that at least one individual directly involved in the alleged plot was previously employed by the Indian government but is no longer associated with India's foreign spy agency. India has submitted the findings of the investigation to U.S. authorities, but no criminal action has been taken against the individual implicated. The U.S. is demanding a criminal prosecution of those involved in the plot. The alleged involvement of an Indian government official in the assassination attempt has raised concerns, with India's foreign ministry expressing dismay over the matter, emphasizing that such actions are contrary to government policy. This incident comes after Canada cited allegations linking Indian agents to the murder of another Sikh separatist leader in June. India has denied any involvement in that case as well. China pushes back on international criticism of restrictive new Hong Kong law. China has defended its new national security law, known as Article 23, passed by Hong Kong lawmakers amid international criticism. The legislation criminalizes acts such as treason, insurrection, theft of state secrets, and external interference, aiming to restore stability following the 2019 pro-democracy protests. Critics argue the law undermines civil liberties guaranteed to Hong Kong under its basic law. The urgency with which the law was passed, with limited public consultation and swift approval by the Legislative Council, has raised concerns about due process and external scrutiny. The U.S. and other governments have expressed opposition to the law, citing poorly defined provisions and potential threats to Hong Kong's open society. Hong Kong officials defend the law as necessary for national security, while critics fear it will lead to further erosion of freedoms, prompting anxiety among various groups, including journalists and financial professionals. The law's implications for media freedom and civil liberties have led to concerns among foreign businesses and organizations, with some considering relocation. Despite assurances from Hong Kong officials, the law's broad scope and vague provisions have raised doubts about its compatibility with the rule of law and its potential to create self-censorship. U.S. says Arunachal Pradesh is part of India, amid Indochina tensions. The U.S. government reaffirmed its recognition of Arunachal Pradesh as part of India and expressed strong opposition to any unilateral attempts to advance territorial claims in the northeastern Indian state bordering China. China asserts territorial claims over Arunachal Pradesh, considering it as part of southern Tibet, a claim that India firmly rejects, asserting Arunachal Pradesh's integral status within its territory. The U.S. State Department emphasized its support for India's territorial integrity and condemned any actions, military or civilian, aimed at altering the line of actual control. Tensions between India and China escalated following deadly clashes in 2020 along their poorly demarcated border in the western Himalayas, leading to increased military deployments and fortifications by both sides. The U.S. and India have strengthened their bilateral ties in recent years as part of efforts to counter China's growing influence in the Indo-Pacific region, amid ongoing tensions between the U.S. and China over various issues, including trade, COVID-19, human rights, Taiwan, and Hong Kong. Australia, UK to boost defence cooperation Australia and the United Kingdom have signed a new defence and security cooperation agreement aimed at facilitating joint operations between their defence forces within each other's territories. The treaty requires consultation between the two nations in the event of a threat. The British Defence Secretary emphasised the importance of collective action in today's geopolitical landscape, citing the evolving global security environment and the relevance of conflicts such as the one in Ukraine to the Indo-Pacific region. The Australian Defence Minister highlighted the strategic significance of the agreement, noting the UK's increased presence in the Indo-Pacific and its commitment to deploying a carrier strike group to the region. As part of the agreement, the UK will contribute to a submarine rotational force in Australia and establish a combined intelligence centre within Australia's Defence Intelligence Organisation.
This collaboration follows the AUKUS deal, under which Australia will acquire U.S. submarines and construct a new AUKUS submarine in Adelaide by 2040. The agreement reflects efforts by Australia to enhance defence interoperability and military exercises with the U.S. and regional partners in response to China's significant military buildup, as highlighted in a defence review conducted last year.